Well, hi, everybody. I'm Philip, Philip Shields, and welcome to Light on the Rock, all of you children of God, members of the house of God. I'm so glad you're here with us on this message. Make sure you do check out the blogs and the video sermons and things like that. And at the very bottom of the home page, uh, you can actually access all of the sermon with hundreds of them. Anyway, there's some very interesting verses at the end of Malachi 3. It underscores how much value our father puts into his children, talking with, speaking to, obviously loving one another, and of course, speaking frequently to him as well. You see, I'm a grandpa, and we just had American Thanksgiving over here, and we have five grandchildren nearby, our daughter and her husband, and they all came by here for Thanksgiving, and um, it was, I, I loved it. It was one of my favorite Thanksgiving times together, and you know what I liked as much as anything was just watching them play games, tease each other, watch their delight as the second oldest beat me for the first time in chess. And then we capped it off with all of them playing on the piano, something for us. We, it was an impromptu piano concert, unrehearsed, unexpected. <laughs> so it wasn't, you know, but it was fun. It was just plain fun watching all of them. I posted couple of them on Facebook. I am going to probably be leaving Facebook, though, in time. So, <clears throat> though I have a lot of people, two or three a day, every day, people I don't know asking me to be friends on Facebook, I have to tell you I am planning to come off Facebook. And so I, and I don't tend to, on Facebook, accept a new f- Facebook friend of somebody I never heard of or don't know, and I rarely hear again from them again when I do that. Uh, make them a friend. So please understand if I don't accept friend request. I'm going to be off of Facebook before long. <clears throat> anyway, it's so much fun just watching them, interacting with each other. And my daughter and her husband have done such a great job. And the fun, the love, the joy that all the fan, five grandkids had with each other just really made my heart sing. I loved it. Now, you know, God's the same way. He's our, He's the ultimate father from whom all the, the very word father comes from him, actually. I think it says that in Ephesians someplace. I, I love that. And so um, Malachi 3, if you turn over there, Malachi 3, verses 16 to 18. I'll also get back to doing videos again, too. Believe me. Malachi 3, verses 16 to 18. Think of Malachi as an end-time book, by the way. Um, I'll get more more to that in just a, a minute. It, it's an end-time book. It describes a condition of God's children at the end of the days I, in our time. So God the Father, God the Highest, one who, who enjoys seeing his children actively engaged with one another, talking, loving, praying, visiting each other. Look what it says here, Malachi 3, verse 16 to 18. Those who, are, those who feared the Lord, Jehovah, those who feared Jehovah spoke to one another. King James says, spoke often or spake often to one another. And Jehovah, the Lord, listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance, I believe this is the book of life was written before him for those who fear Yehovah and who meditate on his name. The Holman translation says, who have a high regard for his name. Verse 17, they shall be mine, says Yehovah of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a man, I'll spare them, as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. <clears throat> there it is. Reading that section, when I, as I was preparing this, brought tears to my eyes. I imagine, imagine God feeling the same joy that I felt watching our grandkids, talking to each other, having fun together. The joy Father in heaven feels when he sees you and me getting along with and talking together, praying together, encouraging one another, loving one another, laughing, living, doing things children do with joyful love, frequent contact. God loves it. Well, how do we do this? We go visit one another. We talk on the phone. We text. We email. We Facebook. And... uh, I'm discontinuing Facebook, as I say, but you can encourage on Facebook. You can send a note. You can send a card. You can talk. 
That's how we talk to each other. We get people over for dinner. We go to their home. They come to our home. We get on the phone. We text. Let me add this, though. Let's make this verse really start coming alive, this verse about talking to one another. I want to say let's do it especially for the infirm, the lonely, the grieving, the new neighbors, the, those who are aging, those who've lost a spouse, those who live by themselves, those who are alone, the old, especially anyone who would welcome the idea that someone thought of them today. Someone wants them to be with you today. Ponder that for a few minutes and determine, ponder before you call them for a few minutes, determine to leave a word of God's encouragement, love and affection as you do and to speak of him, to bring his name up in your chats as you go for a walk around the block and the neighbors there and uh, talk to a man last night. He was saying it's getting horrible and I'm saying it is going to get better. It is going to get better. It'll get worse first. And then eventually you add that Christ is coming and it's going to change. But it's very special to people to know that someone cares about them. And God not only knows you, but is watching you, listening to you. Just as I was listening to my grandkids talk to each other and to us. And God is so delighted when you talk to his other children. David says, not a word on my tongue, and you don't know it already. He's very aware of what you're saying. He says, because his children are doing that, you and he, I mean, you will be his. You are his own prized jewels. He sees you as his treasured possession, as many translations put it. <clears throat> he is so happy as we do that, that God says he will spare you from the times of trouble coming. So I think Father really, really appreciates this interacting going on. The book of Malachi really is an end-time book, and it's a lot of parallels with messages to the Laodicean group of Revelation 3, the seventh of the seven churches, headed by Christ himself. Understand that Malachi is all about children of God in the very last days. Try reading it with that in mind and see what you get from it. What we do know about the last days, Yeshua warned us by asking if he would even find faith on the earth when he returned, Luke 18.8. He says the love of many will harden, will wax cold, King James, in the last days. Matthew twenty four twelve. The love, it won't be we won't be so loving. You know, when you have nothing but violence and crime and robbery and 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 bad stuff going on, as we're seeing around the world in America and here too, yeah, you get toughened up. You 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 don't care as much for for people. You want to throw the book at everybody, you know. He says, many will be offended and turn in and snitch on their own father or mother or brothers or sisters, even handing them over to for a death sentence. I can see that happening because we've already had children turning away from their parents and siblings. And in fact, we see God's children split up in the very the, the churches, the fellowships were splitting up into various fellowships that rarely have anything to do with one another, but somehow, some way, I ask you, be a child of God, pleasing him, who does all, who, someone who will do all in your power to bring people together, various church groups around you. Visit them. Go visit them. So your message to them is clear. I see all of you as my beloved brothers and sisters too. Yeshua said in the days coming, there will be someday one flock, one flock and one shepherd. John ten sixteen. There shall be one flock, not lots of flocks. He's the chief shepherd over all the flocks. But right now we have lots of flocks of God's sheep. There's coming a time when there will be one flock. Apparently there is now one flock, one shepherd. But you and I can live that out now by visiting the various flocks. Yeshua said that if we're not gathering together, we're scattering. Too many groups won't have anything to do with anyone in the other groups. Look at this, Matthew 12, verse 30. Matthew 12, verse 30. He who is not with me is against me. And he who doesn't gather with me scatters abroad. We're either gathering or scattering. Pastors. We'll read 1 Corinthians 10, verses 10 to 12 in a second. Stop prohibiting God's sheep from visiting other flocks of God. 
of God's sheep. Some of you pastors prohibit this. That surely must stop. The flock needs to be followers of the chief shepherd, Yeshua, not you. They can follow you as you follow Christ, but he wants us talking to one another. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 10 to 12. I'll read this out of the New Living Translation. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10 to 12. If I said 10, I mean chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 to 12. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters. We're all brothers and sisters. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? He's saying that I'm speaking to you as Yeshua himself would. Live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying I'm a follower of Paul. Others of you are saying I'm, I follow Apollos. Or I follow Peter. Or the best ones, I follow only Christ. But you're breaking up into factions, he's saying. <clears throat> Be living out the love that's so spectacular among God's true believers that you're not doing that. You're not saying, well, I really like this pastor or that pastor best and I'm, I'm part of this group. And then you diss everybody else. Don't do that. In John 13, 34, 35, John 13, verses 34, 35, Yeshua says this, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And you can actually find that in the book of Leviticus and other places. But he says it's new. And what makes it new is what he says here, as I have loved you. I want you to have that kind of love for each other. So let's read it again. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. He's saying love each other that way. And what way did he love us? When we were not so, when we were not so lovable. When we were sinners. When we failed to reach the goal when we fell short of expectations he still loves us <clears throat> some of you think he doesn't I'm going to talk about that soon in a sermon on God's favor God's grace I hope you hear it by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another this is the very main characteristic whereby people will know that you are my people okay so, so this teaching as, use this teaching as a prod to do what Malachi 3, 16 to 18 says, speak often to other fellow believers. Some of you are already thinking though, that won't be me. I find it really hard to talk to other people. I, I'm an introvert. I'm not, I'm not the extrovert kind that just naturally wants to talk to everybody like our puppy dog, like our dog does. Not puppy anymore. But she thinks everybody wants to talk to her. So Zoe goes up there and wants to love on everybody. Very outgoing. <laughs> Ask for God's miraculous help in a case like that to transform you to become a person who can and does reach out. It's not the natural you. Ask for God's gifts of his spirit. Remember that a gift is not something you already had, but was given to you. You didn't already have that. It's something new being added to your personality. We say people are gifted with musical talent or this. Well, that's what they were born with. But God's gifts are something you are not born with, but are given to you externally by God to make you something you are not now. I want you to think about that as you read, as we read this in 1 Corinthians 12, where it talks about some of the gifts of God. I'll read some of them here. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, there are diversities of gifts with the same spirit. There are Differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are di diversities of activities, but it's the same God working in all of you. You do different things different ways, but at least if we're teaching, believing as much as possible, the same thing, we, can, we that's fine. And then verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. To one is given the word of wisdom. But it's, it's not that word of wisdom is not given to you just so you're wiser. It's given to you or me so that we can share it with others. So verse 8, the one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. And it goes on from there. 
So when God gives us his gifts, it often takes courage to step out and use something you didn't have before to use the gift he's given you. At first it's scary crossing between two huge towers of water when you cross the Red Sea, right? Those are stories, but they're supposed to tell us to live these out as well. <clears throat> God told them, quit standing still. In Exodus 14, verse 13, Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. By the time you come to verse 15, he's saying, quit just standing there, get moving. Moses, stretch your hand out over the Red Sea and tell the Israelites to get moving. So there comes a time to quit waiting, to quit just watching, to quit just standing still, and to get moving. That step in faith takes courage. So step out in faith, even when what God is asking you to do is hard, such as talking to other people if you're not the talk to other people kind of person. I have a lady friend in Texas who took my encouragement to reach out. And she sends emails to a man in Florida, a friend of mine in his 60s, who is bedridden from severe end-stage multiple sclerosis, MS. He can't move anything below his neck. Literally nothing. But her emails certainly let the man with MS realize he's not forgotten. He's not forgotten. Or forsaken by other brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank God for her and others who communicate with him. Thank God for them. The man in Oregon who calls him once in a while, prays with him and so on, and they talk together. But she stepped out in faith to a man she's never met. Now, if you're the more extroverted kind of person who sense some people are shy or introverted, especially in church services, your fellowship meetings, Reach out to them especially. You start the conversation. You invite them over for dinner at your home. We tend to prefer to invite those who are the life of the party kind of people or those who've invited us before. But Yeshua said to invite those not being invited, those not so likely to liven up your gathering. Luke 14. Luke 14, verses 12 to 14. Then he said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, don't Ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor the rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. When you give a feast, when you have a dinner party, invite the poor, the maimed. We can look at this also in terms of personality or their spiritual. Some people have, have maimed personalities, are shy, are they've been hurt before and don't want to be hurt again. The lame, the blind, they can't see at all what to say or what to do. Maybe literally blind. These aren't exactly your life of the party kind of people. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So start communicating more. Start letting God's spirit in you reach out, step out in faith. Walk between the towers of water, the Red Sea, your Red Sea. Do whatever frightening thing you normally wouldn't do. Start doing it. If God's gifts are giving you the power to do it, let's do it. Let's do this somehow, some way, before events and circumstances make it hard to do it. <clears throat> there is coming a time when we may not be able to talk together as easily. We remember how government um, closed down the ability to even meet in services, right? And the adversary loves to attack God's children. You know, in a war, one of the first things the enemy would do, and Satan's our enemy, one of the first things he does is to knock out his target's ability to communicate. They can't communicate with their own army, their other people. And they're, so the first thing they, they hit are the defense means, like the anti-aircraft missiles, and the ability to communicate with each other. So that's where Satan will attack us, trying to stop us talking to each other. So use the time you have now to talk together with people while you can. I'm saying especially your parents, grandparents, cousins, nephews, loved ones, special friends. Talk to them, certainly. The time may come that you'd like to go to a ball game or, or to an opera or a show or something and you 
always did it with someone, with your wife, your husband, your parents, eventually you may not be able to do that. I remember, and, and you never know when these opportunities will stop. I like to go visit my friend who has MS, but it's been a long time now, almost two years. I remember one day getting a very, so I call him now. I call him several times a week, <clears throat> at, least, at least once, twice, or three times a week. I remember one day getting a very strong feeling in my heart. Go visit Paul. It's just like someone said it to me. It just I didn't hear a voice, in, but I heard a voice in my head. I heard a strong feeling in my heart. This person who can't move anything below his neck because of his, his MS. He's in a VA nursing home about two hours from our house. Two hours is just long enough that it's not one you just jump out and just go do. And it's four hour round trip. And then longer than that if you stop and do other things. But anyway, so I, I thought well, my first reaction was, well, I'll go next week. This week's kind of full. But then it just this feeling got stronger. Go. So I told my wife, I got to go right now and go see Paul. And Carol asked me, well, why? why? Why today? And I said, I don't know why. But it's a strong, hey, you got to go. You got to go right now kind of a feeling. So I'm going to go. I'm telling you to learn to listen to God's voice. <clears throat> and you'll hear it much more often if you do. And so I went, we visited, and to find out the very next day the federal government lockdowns on federal nursing homes was announced. So learn to be responsive to those things. I haven't been able to go see, I, I haven't been able to. His parents, his siblings, his children, grandchildren, Nobody, his pastors, friends, nobody has been allowed to go see him. And that's in Florida. And I even complained. I said, I thought this was Florida where we don't have all these restrictions. And the guy at the VA said, well, this is a federal nursing home. So we go by federal Biden's rules. So I couldn't go. But anyway, my point is our ability to talk to each other in person, at least, could be curtailed without notice. Pandemics, traffic snarl-ups, shutdowns, death. Don't be sitting on the sidelines wishing you had done more when you could have. My own brother, who suffered strokes and heart attack, and his wife had Alzheimer's, my brother could barely take care of himself. So at some point he had to put his wife in a nursing home, and he used to go see her every day. And even though it was very difficult for him to even get around and move, but a few days before she died, uh, but then the COVID hit, and they wouldn't let him in at all. Finally, a few days before she died, they finally let him in to go see her briefly. Our loved ones may die quickly, unexpectedly. Then we can't talk anymore. Talk while you can. They might get Alzheimer's, not be able to know who you even are. Happened to my wife with her mom, and she's since died as well. So other things can stop us eventually, besides government lockdowns, and um, <clears throat> keep in mind that Satan in the very end time is going to probably within the last 10 years of the end time is going to be cast out of heaven in his battle with Michael, the archangel. I don't know if that's already happened or about to happen. I sense it's coming soon if it hasn't already. Satan is angry. His evil, foul, murderous, demonic spirit is filling the planet. If you find yourself saying, what the is going on? What on earth is going on around me? It's because the demonic influences are getting stronger. I gave a sermon on that recently. He's behind all of that, what we're watching. It's his spirit. Remember, he is the one, John 10 says, who loves to come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Natural disasters can stop even cell phones and all communications or ability to travel. You get a strong EMP, electromagnetic pulse, from the sun, a really strong one. It can knock out all of our electronics if it's big enough and bad enough. Or if the enemy drops a special kind of bomb in the atmosphere above us, same thing. Our, our cars won't start, the garages won't start, lights won't turn on, our military won't do much, be able to do much, and life will come to a standstill. Hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, wildfires, earthquakes in diverse places can change our ability to go see people, to visit people. Certainly pandemic lockdowns can keep us from crossing state lines or countries. 
right now I can't go anywhere unless I get vaccinated. And even then, you've got to have a two week, uh, a two week uh, quarantine. And, you know, who wants to pay for all that money to be sitting around before you can do anything? But even earthquakes can, can change everything. Uh, in the area of crossing several states, Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas, Missouri, and other states around that, there's what they call the New Madrid Fault Line. I think it was in 1811. There was a huge earthquake. And, and, and that will impact the eastern half of the United States tremendously. It will be felt over much of the east coast. I mean the eastern half. And you West Coast people, you know about San Andrea and hundreds of, uh, or at least scores of, of uh, other fault lines. I saw a fault line once of all the, I saw a map one time, all the fault lines, uh, earthquake fault lines in California. I thought I was looking at a freeway map. It was worse than a freeway map. These were fault lines all over the state. And even all around the world, we have this ring of fire and things where uh, you're expected to get earthquakes, but earthquakes in diverse places implies that God's going to allow earthquakes where we don't normally see them. So, by the way, stock up now. Food, water for at least three months. Even as we trust in God, Joseph, remember, saved up in the seven years of plenty. So stock up now on things while you can. Uh, cleaning wipes, the Lysol or Clorox wipes, toilet paper, batteries, food, water, firewood, extra propane. Don't be foolish. Stock up now. And again, people can die on us, and then we won't be able to talk to people. Wars can change everything. Wars can change supply chain dramatically. A lot of the oil, a lot of power, a lot of, uh, a lot of the oil that comes out of the uh, Strait of Hormuz. So if there's a war between Iran and anybody else, especially Israel, a lot of that can stop. China-Taiwan war, maybe after the Olympics. And that whole area there has a lot of uh, commerce that's involved with it. Russia, Ukraine, Iran, Israel. These kinds of wars could stop commerce in a big way. And remember, a big, big war like World War I was started by one bullet. Franz Joseph, Franz, Franz Joseph Ferdinand. Was that the one? I think <laughs> my history is right. I think that was the one. We now have hypersonic missiles that China has that we can't track that we can't defend against. One retired general even said just a week or so ago that China could right now wipe out our army bases and our Navy aircraft carriers and all that, especially near and around the Asia area, and we wouldn't even know what hit us till it hit us. So things can change very, very quickly. This is the time. To apply that second greatest commandment, to love others as yourself. Talk to them, encourage them, love them. It's the second commandment. First commandment, love God. And so I think that's really, really important. I, I say just for tossing this in, this extra credit, watch the papacy, the Pope. In this coming year especially, I just have a hunch. Something big could happen. I'm not prophesying. I'm not a prophet. Light on the Rock is a non-profit, non-profit organization. <laughs> anyway, but seriously, watch the papacy. Uh, that can change things in a hurry too. Watch Israel, the Middle East especially as well. Watch Europe. I believe the Antichrist system, the end time beast and false prophet will arise from Europe. I want to give a sermon soon on that and explain. I want to be watching Christ, by the way, as my primary focus, not the Antichrist. But I think it's good for you to know some things to be aware of. Uh, our focus, though, should be on Yeshua, on him. But I will give a sermon soon, I hope, on the Antichrist and how it's, it's just all over. It's all through and out throughout Europe. Uh, all the vestiges of Babylon and everything else is all through there. Anyway, so please call. Now, some of you won't reach out because no one ever calls me or comes by to see me or invites me to dinner. Well, guess what? I don't get that many phone calls, emails either. I really don't. Okay, I have about maybe seven people that I hear from fairly regularly, mostly to do with Light on the Rock, or people that we help out. But other than those six or seven people who call me once in a while or e email or text me, 
I don't. We don't get invited out to dinner much unless we ask or something or or when I say we ask, I mean, when we sort of say, hey, it's been a while. Can we get together? But anyway, <clears throat> Yeshua said, love one another as I have loved you. So it doesn't matter if you've been called or loved or text or invited for dinner. Love them like Christ would love them. Love them anyway. Let's follow God's example. He still sent his son, his son to show his love to all of us while we were still sinners. Romans 5 says, so love those who don't show you love. Love them anyway. Love even our enemies, Yeshua said. Love them anyway. Call and show concern for people who don't show you any concern anyway. Pray for those who need prayers anyway, even if you don't think they're praying for you. Be one who fears God in the right way and receive his blessings. Obey Malachi 3, 16 to 18. Talk often to one another. So, let's make those phone calls. Texts, emails, Instagrams, however you communicate with people, cards, letters. So many will be encouraged simply by your quick five or ten minute call. Someone actually thought about me. They, they, they'll be thinking to themselves, I can't believe this. I guess that's why I'm still on Facebook once in a while. I like to give an encouraging comment to someone who's down. I just did somebody who's saying, well, no one cares. And I, I made a comment or gave her a heart response or something. Um, <clears throat> instead of preaching at her or saying things she can do, just just respond. We care. Whatever. Two words. So even a five-minute call can make all the difference. But I don't know what to say. What do you talk about when you talk? Well, any talking with others would not include, of course, any gossip, because that separates even the very best of friends. And... Uh, Love covers a multitude of transgressions, but a whisper separates separates very friends. Proverbs sixteen twenty eight and seventeen nine say sixteen twenty eight and seventeen nine. I'm going to read Ephesians four twenty nine. In the King James, New King James, it says, "Impart grace, impart favor to those you speak with." This is the New Living Translation. Don't use foul or abusive language. You know what? We've got to stop using foul and abusive language even about our leaders whom we may not like. God says to to honor them, to honor the king, 1 Peter 2.17. Honor the king. The king that Peter was writing about then was Nero, who killed a lot of Christians in the Colosseum in a most brutal way. Honor him. Because Romans 13 says all authority is from God. Hard to believe sometimes. Grant you that. But that's what we're told. Be respectful of them. And certainly don't use F words and all those kinds of or, or bathroom language and all that. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful. I'm reading Ephesians 4.29, New Living. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement, will impart grace to those who hear them. So when you call someone, say, I'm, I, you know, I, I like to, pa- to pause just a few seconds or a minute and just ponder and think, OK, I, I, I'm hoping that this call will leave them encouraged instead of just hurrying into it and hurrying off of it. Speak of your love for our Father and Yeshua, the King of Kings. Speak of speak of God. Don't have a conversation after conversation where we don't even mention God or Jesus or Yeshua. <clears throat> mention that you're looking forward to his return. Share your family news. Or if you're talking to someone who is sick or grieving, please take the time to ask questions and listen, listen, listen. Be there for them. Let them talk to you. Listen more than you talk. In most circumstances, especially where they're hurting, be encouraging. Assure them of your love, your prayers, that I'm here for you if you ever need anything. And then make sure you are. Share what you're learning. I remember one time when when our son died. At first I wanted no contact with anybody. I just wanted to be left alone. But shortly after that, I called my best friend minister in uh, Canada at the time, 
who lived four hours away. And he says, do you want us to come up? I said, yes, I do. And in less than four hours, he was at our door. So he must have immediately left, thrown some things in a suitcase and came over. I said, you stay with us for two or three days. I'd really, really, I need that. That really meant so much to me. So share what you're learning from your own Bible studies. These are, I'm talking about things you can talk about. To the infirm, ask them if they'd like you to read to them from the Bible. Some would say, yes, I'd love you to do that. Share interesting sermon highlights that you've heard. You can share some things that are encouraging and uplifting versus depressing topics. You can share your excitement about knowing Christ is coming back soon. Leave them encouraged. Confess your own health in personal areas where you need their prayers. <clears throat> where you need their prayers. I hope you're following what I'm saying. And then pray once in a while together during or at the end of your call. Pray once in a while together. In Acts 12, you read how Herod had already taken James, the apostle, and killed him, beheaded him. So he thought, well, the leading Jews around here, the priests and all that, they were pretty happy with that. So he took Peter, put him in jail. He was going after the, the heads, the leaders. <clears throat> so here's Peter in jail, in chains, multiple guards all around him. But the whole church had already seen God allow one to be beheaded. Imagine how they felt about Peter. Oh no, not a second one. The whole church in Jerusalem started gathering at someone's home. I think it was Mary's home in Acts 12. And God heard their prayers. You can read the story in Acts 12. But my point is, as you talk to people of God, especially those who can't get out, or who are in nursing homes, or are recovering from an illness, or are shut out, or have, don't have a car, or whatever, once in a while, if not every time, say, can we pray together? And do pray together. I think it means something. I don't do it every time. But I, I will do it once in a while, with different ones, my brother, with all other different, different ones from time to time. Or how about in church services? Here's what Paul says. He expects each one to think in terms of what can I contribute today in the body when we come together. Paul does not describe church meetings as being the kind of meeting where just one or two people run the whole show. No, it's a fellowship. You might call yours a fellowship, but is that the way it's run or still is it still just one or two doing all the talking? So go back and reread 1 Corinthians 14 in its entirety. These meetings are supposed to include input and contributions and speaking from many who are there. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. I'm going to read out of the CJB, the complete Jewish Bible. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What's our conclusion, brothers? Whenever you come together, let everyone be ready with a psalm. Let everyone be ready with something. He says, with a psalm or a teaching or a revelation. Something that God's revealed to you in your studies this week. Or ready to use his gift. God gives you a gift. He wants you to use that gift. Or ready to use his gift of tongues or give an interpretation. But let everything be done to build the church up for edification. So even at our fellowship meetings, church services, we should all pray that at least once in a while, if not always, we will have something to say, to contribute, to share, to build the, the group up with edification. The problem is in a lot of Church of God fellowships, that doesn't happen. The opportunity doesn't happen. You might have a, a, a soloist or a choir, a song leader, and the sermon, the sermon preacher. Or you might just have the preacher and a song leader. That's about it. That's not the way they're described in the Bible. Church services, I mean. So even at our fellowship meetings and church services, we should all pray we have something to contribute. And pastors, I hope you'll think this over. When I was part of a church that had that kind of format, I often asked questions during my sermon and asked the 
people to contribute, to say something. I have a sermon called the Repenting of What You Are that I gave in San Jose, California, years and years ago. I was a young man then, probably about 30 years ago. I think it's on our website. You can put it in the search bar, Repenting of What You Are, or Repent of What You Are. Try, try both. That, that should come up. You'll hear my inclusion of the brethren. Of course, doing it this way, where I'm speaking just from a bedroom or an office to you, no one here, just me and the wall and my dog Zoe laying quietly. <laughs> That's it. <clears throat> I can't ask for your input, but I'd love your comments, by the way. I'd love you to comment. Uh, you have to register for Light on the Rock and then, and then leave comments. I would absolutely love it. So let's talk to one another more often in the New Covenant. I don't think church services were supposed to be primarily just the pastor and song leader. Okay, pastors, please open that up to your church. So let's talk to one another. Let's take note of those who are doing this. God takes note of it. And he will reward them. He will protect them. They will protect you in time of trouble. Plus your name is, it sounds to me, reading Malachi 3, more likely to be in the book of life, at least partly because of your phone calls to other brethren. So can we commit to calling, texting, communicating somehow with at least one or two people a week? Many more if you can especially the infirm or those in hospitals or bedridden, longing for a friend or someone to care enough to call them, care enough to think about them, and your phone call proves to them, proves to them that they matter to you. Our opportunities to do all this can stop suddenly. So use the time we have. The calls don't have to be long. Even just a five-minute call or less will be understood as saying to them, wow, someone actually thought about me today. And they'll feel better. Our God is listening. Our God is watching you and me. Our God wants to add our names to his book of remembrance. So let's do it. Let's please our Father. He likes this. Father in heaven, we just come to you at the end of this. Just ask you to please help us to apply and live Malachi 3, verses 16 to 18. Help those of us who are reluctant to get on the phone or text or contact people or we're just not that way as a person. Help us to be able to step out in faith and do it. Those who are extroverted and find it more easy to do it, then please let them do it. And uh, be inviting people over for dinner or just talk to people who they know are not the most vivacious or loquacious or people who can talk a lot easily. But still let them know you, they, you, that they care. Father, help us to be more like you, and we want to, you to know that, yeah, we do love one another. Help us to demonstrate it better. Fill us with your Holy Spirit of love. Thank you that you love us so much. Help us to love you more, and help us to love one another, the second great commandment. Help us to love one another as ourselves. Help us to love you with everything we've got. Thank you, Father, and thank you, Yeshua. Thank you so much for all you've been and all you've done. In your name, Yeshua. Amen.